Welcome to day 10 of Shadowhunters Month, and today's video is another book club one, <clears throat> uh, much in the similar vein uh, to the Tales from the Shadowhunter Academy one I did a couple of days ago, um, and this time, um, obviously it was randomly generated what order I did these in, um, but this time, very exciting, uh, it's the Infernal Devices Trilogy, which was the second series of books to come out. Um, and it's the first chronologically, I think. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to be talking about the three books in the trilogy, um, giving my thoughts and going over the plot and stuff like that. Um, the thing with the Inferno Devices for me, it was zero to a hundred real quick, I think, for me, because I'd finished reading the Modern Instruments, um, and I'd bought the other book, the Infernal Devices, in advance so I could start reading them as soon as I was done with Mortal Instruments. Um, and I got to the end of Mortal Instruments and I was like, oh god, that was so good, I don't think anything can match up. Um, I don't think I'm gonna enjoy reading the books without these characters, I absolutely adore in them. And there's no way I'll ever love any characters more than the characters in the Mortal Instruments. Um, and I was completely fucking wrong. <laughs> um, it took me a while to get into the first one originally. Because um, I read like the first chapter. And I was intrigued and everything. Um, but then I left it for ages. I left it for, well not ages, a couple of weeks. Um, and then I went back to it. and just decided to read it again. I thought I might as well. Then I really got into the flow of it. <clears throat> and I just binged the series then. <laughs> Um, in, I think it was a matter of days I ended up reading them all in. Um, I just could not put it down. It was always great when I had weekends off at uni, because I would literally just sit on my bed and read these Shadowhunter books. Those are my fond memories of my first year of uni. Um, so yeah, I just binged read the entire trilogy, and my god, I completely fell in love. Um, with the characters, with the story, everything. Um, some of my favourite characters in the whole Shadowhunters universe are in the Infernal Devices. Um, you know, there are some really funny moments, the moments that break your heart. Um, the epilogue destroys me every single time to third book, um, Clockwork Princess. <sighs> man. Um, so yeah, anyway. Uh, I will start getting in to the first one, which is... Da -da -da. Uh, Clockwork Angel, I think, isn't it? Yeah, Clockwork Angel. Um, this is like the second edition UK cover. So it was like the original one when it first came out. But I preferred these ones when I saw them in the shop, so I, I got this set. Uh, so yeah, it's got Will on the front. Always good. Um, so yeah, I've got a lot of notes. That's why I keep looking down. Because I've kind of just written out the whole story in my notepad. Um, so, where should we begin? Maybe talk about briefly some of the characters we meet in the first one. Um, obviously we have Tessa, Will and Jem. Um, who I adore, each and every single one of them. I adore them as a trio. I adore them in, like, individual couples. I adore them as Parabatai. I adore them individually. Um, but if you want a lot more thoughts about that, I've already done a video in Shadowhunters Month. Um, completely about why I love Tessa, Will and Jem, so be sure to check that out if you haven't. Um, and obviously, spoilers for <laughs> the Infernal Devices, um, major ones. Um, so here we have those three who I absolutely love. And we are also introduced to Charlotte and Henry. Um, kind of like Charlotte, kind of the head of the London Institute. Henry is her husband seems a bit hapless, he's like a keen inventor, um, and Charlotte is very much concerned that Henry's very distant from her and doesn't actually love her. Um, and we see them go on an incredible journey as a couple um, throughout the books, um, but also Charlotte is kind of has this whole plot where she has to kind of take on the consul and take on the whole clave, fighting to keep her position and stuff. Um, some really intriguing kind of insight into the clave and how corrupt some people can be. Um, but luckily she won the day. Um, 
We also had Jessamine, um, who is quite frankly a bit of a bitch. <laughs> um, particularly in the first couple of books. Um, I mean, she's not really in the third book a lot, is she? Um, when she shows up, she dies, and then she's a ghost at the end. Um, and I actually like Jessamine a lot more as a ghost than I did when she was alive. Um, but, you know, she serves her purpose, and she has her moments. Um, and I think it's very interesting what they do with her, particularly in the first one. Um, where she doesn't really want to be there, and she doesn't really want to be part of like, the Shadowhunter world. She'd rather be a mundane, which I think is a very interesting kind of um, character arc. Um, we also had Sophie. Sophie's my cinnamon roll. I love her. Um, so she's kind of like a maid for them. Um, she's also kind of ashamed of that. And she has her scar and everything. She's very, very insecure, which sucks because she's just, oh, beautiful and adorable. And I love her. Um, and I love her kind of growth throughout the whole show as well. The whole show? The whole series. Um, and then just for the first book, we have Thomas and Agatha. Um, Agatha being the cook, Thomas being like, I don't want to say slave, but, you know, he does a lot of work for them. Um, and unfortunately they both die and get replaced with their siblings in the sequels. Um, and then also Magnus obviously shows up in Clockwork Angel and throughout the Infernal Devices. Um, you know, he's pops in and out. He's not like a main character in it, but when he shows up, like, shit goes down, and it's incredible seeing him interact with people outside of the modern instruments for me, because I'd never seen that prior to reading these. Um, and I love the bond he ended up forming with Will. I think it's a really special friendship. And obviously then with Tessa. Um, it's an incredible thing, the bond that he has with all these characters. Um, we also have Camille, who I knew from Mortal Instruments, so it was nice seeing her and the days when she and Magnus were like together. Um, so that was always interesting. Then we had Tessa's brother Nate. What a prick. Axel. What a bigger prick. Um, then Alexei de Quincy, like the vampire clan leader. Um, he's not a particularly great person, but um, he does end up kind of being falsely accused of being the Magister. Um, the Dark Sisters, who are creepy as fuck. I hate them. They're gross. Um, look, they're very effective kind of secondary villains for me. I really enjoyed their presence um, throughout the series. And then Brother Enoch is in it quite a bit. Um, he was just a silent brother who regularly visits the Institute and helps out whenever he can. Um, so those are kind of the main characters from the first novel, really. Um, and we start off with Tessa being trained by the Dark Sisters when she arrives looking for her brother, who's apparently gone missing because her aunt's just died. Um, and then she's kind of taken by the Dark Sisters and turns out she has like this ability to shapeshift. She doesn't know where it came from, why she has it. Um, and the Dark Sisters kind of really train her to use that um, to embody different people and stuff like that. Um, and to tell her that, you know, they've kind of arranged her to marry the Magister, this like mysterious figure. Um, so right from the off we get a very interesting kind of setup and mystery um, to really follow and get invested in. Um, you know, the mystery, why did, how does Tessa have these abilities and these powers, you know? Um, so right from the off there's something that we're keen to find out about. Um, and then, you know, if things happen, she tries to escape and all that. Um, Will and Jem's investigation into murders and stuff leads to the Dark Sisters' house, so therefore Will meets Tessa. Um, they all go back to the Institute. Will and Tessa have a lot of time to bond. Um, you know, this kind of romance slowly building with them, um, but he's very hot and cold with her, which is again another mystery set for why Will acts the way he does. Um, and I think I've mentioned this somewhere before, but um, I love. Um, Tessa and Jem together um, but I do prefer Tessa and Will um, but the beauty of this story is it's not a competition it doesn't need to be a competition with this like love triangle because everyone gets happy endings with everyone which I think is kind of a beautiful thing um, but yeah I think maybe it's just because 
Tessa kind of had a romantic spark with Will first, and there was just a romance with them kind of before there was a romance with Tess and Jem. Um, so if it had been the other way around, maybe I would have preferred Tess and Jem from the off, but I don't dislike them at all. I think they're actually quite adorable. And I love how long it kind of, you know, how long Jem had to wait before Tessa. I think it's really, really, like, a beautiful story for them. Um, but I do slightly prefer Tessa and Will. Um, but yeah, he's, you know, I mean, he's a, he's a bastard to her at some points, but you kind of understand why eventually. But yeah, um, there's an instant bond between them, and then Tessa kind of meets everyone at the Institute and all that, and like, that dinner scene just means kind of being a bitch as always. Um, and then Tessa and Jem bond for a little bit, because she hears him playing the violin, um, which comes back to break my heart in the epilogue. And then Jem starts having like this coughing fit, and there's the mystery with Jem's character. You know, what on earth's going on with him? Um, so Will has to kind of come to his rescue, and we're wondering, what's up with that? What's up with that? Um, and then there's like this continuing, ongoing investigation and mystery throughout the whole of the first novel, which leads Charlotte and Henry to meet up with Axel Mortmain. Um, but obviously, at this point, they don't know that he's the Magister and Axel points them in the direction of De Quincey, the leader of the vampire clan at the Pandemonium Club. Um, and then Jem and Will are investigating, I think it was the Dark Sisters' house again, or a different house altogether, and the Dark Sisters kind of maid attacks them, and it turns out she's kind of like clockwork and an automaton, um, which is very interesting. And that is one thing I really love about the Inferno Devices, you know, not just the characters and their emotional journeys and their story arcs, um, but kind of like the steampunk kind of vibe. I really like like steampunk items and stuff. I don't have a lot of them, um, but I really like the kind of aesthetic of that. So I really like that we had that running through the Inferno Devices. Um, so we had all that going on, and then um, Jessamine and Tessa try and bond a bit. Um, we get a bit more insight into Jessamine as a character, which I think was needed. And then we have a bit where a goblin shows up and Jessamine kills it. Um, and yes, yeah, so then we find out about Miranda, the servant of the Dark Sisters, being an automaton and Henry's kind of examining her and everything. And then Camille shows up, of course, um, which was a very nice surprise. And then she kind of spills the beans about De Quincey and what he's up to and stuff like that um, and how there's a party that they should all attend um, because he kind of puts on performances with mundanes um, so I think it's Will and Tessa who kind of decide to go and Magnus comes along Camille said that you know her lover will join them that's when we kind of get Magnus into the story which is always awesome um, and then, at the party, we find out that one of the mundanes De Quincey is using for a performance is Nate. And, you know, we see he's alive, um, and obviously Tessa kind of blows her cover to try and get to him, and there's this huge, really awesome, epic battle sequence, which I really enjoy. Um, and then, following that, back at the Institute, um, Wood and Tessa kiss for the first time, and I was like punching the air because I was kind of rooting for it. Um, but then obviously Will turns cold with her again, tries to push her away, which really upsets her, which leads her to be comforted by Jem. Um, and then we get that scene where um, Jem shows her his favourite spot in London. They get attacked by more like automatons. They come back to the Institute, Jem's like collapsing, barely made it back. And then we finally get the answer to what is up with Jem? And we find out about, you know, his kind of need for yin fen, even though that drug is slowly killing him. Um, but that's why he has, like, silver hair, silver eyes and stuff like that. Um, really interesting kind of story beat and a character arc for Jem. Because um, you kind of think you know where the story's going to go at the end of the trilogy. Um, because you think there's no way out for Jem. But then... <laughs> Um, things happen. Um, but yeah, I really liked that kind of mystery being solved for Jem, you know, in the first book, because obviously it, it took a while for the mystery of Tessa and the mystery of Will to kind of get resolved. 
So I'm glad we got, you know, some some answers while also more questions kind of being set up at the same time. Um, and then Mortmain ends up sending some people in the Institute on a wild goose chase and he's revealed to be the true Magister. He attacks the Institute which leads to the death of Thomas and Agatha. Um, and to try and save everyone at the Institute, Tessa agrees to marry Mortmain. Um, and then when like the army flees, she fakes her death and she like changes into a victim that she'd had to be before um, and fakes her death in front of Mortmain. Um, and Will is kind of devastated when he kind of finds her um, and in doing so kind of reveals his feelings for her. And then she kind of announces that she's not dead, she faked it. Um, but it's like this huge setback for Mortmain so it's kind of another quiet before the storm if you will. Um, and then Tess is very forward then in, I think she's really learned across the first book to really be brave. Um, and then she is brave by putting herself out there and telling Will she kind of wants a relationship with him. Um, and he kind of puts on this facade and rejects her and saying, you know, they could fool around, but he wouldn't want anything serious. And why would a shadow hunter kind of be with like a warlock? who can't have kids, and that's the first time she finds out she can't have children, apparently. Um, and she's kind of devastated by that. And, you know, she sees kind of through Will's facade, but she has to kind of believe it for now. Um, because, you know, Gemma told her that um, Will often lies to make himself look worse. Um, so we have that really heartbreaking moment where Will's kind of like, bye. Um, which then... Again, another kind of repeating theme. Will kind of hurts Tessa, and Tessa finds comfort in Jem. Um, and Jem clearly seems to be having feelings for her, but she doesn't really pick up on that just yet. And then the Clockwork Angel necklace that she'd lost in the battle flies back to her. Um, says, like, what's going on with that thing? Um, so another kind of mystery near the end of the book being set up, as well as then in the epilogue where we revisit Magnus, and Will shows up and it's kind of begs for help about something. Um, so therefore we know that there's a reason Will is acting the way he's doing, um, and that sets up a huge mystery that plays a big part in the second book. Um, so yeah, that is Clockwork Angel. Um, really, really solid and interesting first book to a trilogy. Um, I think they kind of, Cassandra Clare did a really great job of establishing these characters um, and setting up a really interesting new threat and obviously building a, a new world for us because we're in London for this trilogy um, which is awesome because I know London quite well so that really allowed me to really get involved in the Inferno Devices um, my sister lives in London so um, and you know they re-established like what Shadowhunters are and everything you could easily read these books without having read the model instruments and you wouldn't really be lost because they kind of explain the key things again but it doesn't feel like they're just shoving the plot down your face it's very subtly done um there's a lot of amazing character work which i think cassandra clare always excels at um and a lot of interesting mysteries for the rest of the trilogy as well as um getting some really satisfying answers to some mysteries that had already been set up like gem and the infen um, so yeah, I really, really like the first book. Um, I would find it hard, I think, to pick my favourite out of the Inferno Devices. I really do like, um, the last one, Clockwork Princess, because of the emotional gut punch of the ending, but I think they're all, like, really, really good. And when I got to the end of Clockwork Angel, and I was like, well, <laughs> I'm invested, this is going to destroy me. Um, so I think it definitely did its job in terms of that. Um, and then, this next one, yeah, we have the second one, Clockwork Prince, um, I think it's a little bit longer actually, the second one, um, and we have, in terms of characters, just to mention right from the off, um, Cyril and Bridget, who are kind of like the replacements for Thomas and Agatha, um, I believe Cyril is Thomas's brother. Um, and I think Bridget is related to Agatha as well. 
Um, but obviously we spend a bit more time with Cyril and Bridget because um, they're in the last two books. Particularly Bridget, um, we find out she can really like hold her own and there's like that running joke of her singing really morbid songs and everything which I really like. Um, it's nice that they include these jokes throughout the whole thing because a lot of shit goes down and a lot of hearts get broken. Um, and then we also have the Lightwoods that I've introduced in this book. Um, which I completely forgot. I didn't realise um, Gideon and Gabriel weren't in the first one. They're only in the second and third book. And because I think so fondly of them and they're such huge characters in the Infinite Devices, I always thought they were in it right from the off, but they're not. Um, so we meet Gabriel and Gideon Lightwood in this one, the two brothers, and their father, Benedict, who seems a bit shady, slim shady. Um, and yeah, we kind of, this is where it really kicks off the plot for Charlotte, I think. Um, and her kind of fighting against the console and the clave and desperately trying to hold on to her power because um, some people don't really trust her leadership skills following the events of the first book. Um, so we kind of start off with like this council meeting um, and ben Benedict openly challenges Charlotte for the position of the Institute. Um, and we kind of get the main plot line for the second book where Charlotte is given two weeks to track down Mortmain, or at least have a very good idea of where he is. Um, and then they'll kind of review whether or not she should be running the Institute. Um, so right from the off, you know, there's the stakes. Let's go on with it. Um, and then Gabriel and Gideon are sent to um, the Institute as well for that period of time to train everyone who hasn't had training um, in case, you know, any attacks and everything. Um, and obviously there's a lot of tension between Tessa and Will, following the ending of uh, Clockwork Angel, um, Tessa's still very much hurt by Will's actions, and we know that Will's very much torn up inside as well from something we don't know about yet. Um, and then we get, you know, a scene where Magnus is summoning up demons um, with Will there, and Will saying, you know, that's not the one. So they found the demons again. So I'm like, okay, so Will's looking for a demon, um, but. You know, we still have that question of why, um, what on earth could possibly be going on. Um, and then we get a moment, um, another kind of lingering mystery set up where Sophie spots Jessamine dressed as a man and sneaking out of the Institute acting very shady. Um, so we're left wondering what's going on with that. And we get a really enjoyable kind of training sequence with everyone um, where... Um, Gideon is like training Sophie and Gabriel is training Tessa um, and Bridget kind of shows that she's actually kind of a badass um, which I really like um, and then we get um, a lot of insight into Mortman's past as well because Charlotte kind of did some research and she finds out that um, Mortman was adopted and his parents were kind of killed by Shadowhunters, I think. Um, so we kind of get that motivation for him. He's not just evil for the sake of it. There's like this tragic backstory to him, which I really enjoy. Um, and then all this leads us to like Alossius Starkweather, I think is how you pronounce his name. <laughs> I I kind of wrote it down and then realised I have no idea how to actually pronounce this, but it's like it's spelled like Alossius, Aloysius. However, like that is. Um, and where he lives in York, so Will, Tessa and Jem kind of go there. Um, nice bit of foreshadowing as well, because um, obviously the Tessa couldn't pass for being a shadow hunter. Um, they pretend that she is Jem's mundane fiance, which is kind of nice, paralleling the end of the book. Um, and you know they kind of get the information they need from Alossius, um, trying to find out you know, what he knows about Mortmain and everything. And then get a really nice sequence where Will leaves a present for Tessa outside her room when they get back. And um, he's written like a funny poem inside, um, so showing that he does have a heart and kind of a, an apology almost. Um, and yeah, Tessa kind of at Alossius's place. She really, the first time really gets a sense of how badly downworlders have been treated and that makes her feel very uneasy 
um, which leads to her having bad dreams and then when Will tries to comfort her and kiss her she has to reject him because she doesn't want to be caught in this cycle of being you know treated nicely by him and then being rejected by him which speaks a lot to the strength of her character and how far she's kind of grown and how much Will hurting her has made her grow up as a person as well um, and then um, Tessa, Will and Jem um, investigate Ravenscar Manor which is nearby um, and another big plot thread that kind of takes hold mainly in the third book is kind of set up um, where Will spots his sister Cecily at the mansion and wonders if you know his whole family are there um, because he abandoned them like five years prior um, but they're attacked by automatons and then they kind of return to London Will goes to see Magnus again and that's when we get um, one of my favourite reveals in all of Shadowhunters where we find out why Will acts the way he does and why he pushes people away but not Jem um, we kind of find out about this curse um, and how he believes this demon cursed him that everyone he loved would die and everyone he got close to would die because his sister was killed um, and that's why he kind of pushed Tessa and all that away and kept rejecting her because if she loves him then she would die in his eyes um, and he only kind of lets Jem get close because he's dying anyway so it's like this really tragic explanation and he carries so much guilt and this huge burden on him and it eats him alive um, but he kind of puts on a brave face and pretends to be a jerk because it's just easier um, which is a very Herondale trait because I love that Chase is very much the same way um, and then we kind of very briefly see Ragnar Fell which I love because I really like Ragnar as a character because um, he was kind of hired by Charlotte to keep an eye on Will's family so I loved his inclusion in this um, and then Tessa gets a letter from Magnus saying, you know, keep an eye on Will because he's very troubled and that leads Tessa and Will to investigate, Tessa and Jen even, to investigate Will's room um, and they track him to a drug den because he's kind of um, making himself feel better I suppose and just giving in to temptations which, you know, very much upsets Jem because Will is just using drugs willing and to have fun Whereas, you know, Jem clearly has a very different view on drugs because he needs them to survive, but at the same time it's killing him. Um, then that bonding between Jem and Tessa kind of leads to a passionate moment with them. Um, so we're kind of setting up their growing feelings for each other at the same time as Tessa's torn with Will. Um, so the love triangle comes into like full fruition here. Um, and then after... Um, Tessa kind of knocks over the infern and Jem gets very embarrassed and asks her to leave. She leaves and that's when she spots Jasmine um, dressed as a man. Um, then we kind of get the introduction of Wolseley Scott, the leader of the werewolf pack, which is pretty awesome. Um, I really liked him. I, feel, I wish we kind of got a bit more of him, actually. Um, and also, we had um, a fight between... Gabriel and Sophie. Um, Gabriel is a bit of a dickhead, really, in the second book. Um, and he's saying, you know, he's just ripping into Charlotte and saying, you know, Henry probably doesn't even love her, which leads Sophie to proper smack him, which I love. Um, I love she seems kind of sweet and innocent, but my God, if she got that passion in her, which I really like. Um, and then Will and Tessa have that big fight over the way Will's been treating um, Jem. Um, so again, the tension is being wrapped and, you know, built higher and higher. Um, and obviously it's going to explode at some point, but at this point we don't know when, but all these characters are having all these different little fights over all these different little things, and yet they all beautifully kind of come together in one big explosion, quite literally, at the end. Um, and then we get a really nice scene one of the most underrated romances for me um, where Sophie and Gideon kind of have this bond and Gideon's obviously very smitten with Sophie which I really love um, it's such a sweet kind of relationship then um, you know Willen apologises to Jem and Jem just forgives him like it's nothing because you know they're like they're brothers and 
Um, Sophie then kind of comes clean to Tessa about what she's seen with Jessamine and found a note to Jessamine from Nate, um, which then leads them to this, like, ball. Um, and when they get there, Will and Tessa kiss again. So again, she's very much torn between these two guys. And Will spots this, like, blue-skinned demon and chases after him, and you're like, what the hell's going on there? But at the same time, you're thinking, oh, maybe that is the demon he's been looking for. Um, it took me a while to kind of put two and two together with that. And I was like, what the hell are you doing? Um, but then we kind of learn a bit more about um, just how far Jessamine has gone and how she's betrayed everyone, really, um, almost inevitably, um, and her marriage to Nate and everything, which was quite a plot twist. I actually really liked what they did with that. And then apparently we get some more reveals about Tessa's parentage. Um, and then we get this awesome confrontation near the end uh, where Tessa and Nate kind of reunite and Nate is revealed to be Tessa's cousin, not her brother. Um, and then there's this awesome, like, really amazing epic fight sequence which leads to an automaton exploding which ultimately kills Nate um, and Will you know, kind of throws himself in front of Tessa to protect her, so he's very badly injured. Um, and Tessa's still very torn over Nate's death because she still sees him as a brother and she still has that love for him because he is her family. But at the same time, he's done some really horrible things. Um, and then we kind of, if they see Tessa kind of recover from her injuries, his will's recovering as well. Um, really nice sequence, which kind of also is a prelude to the third book where Tessa has a very extended kind of period of recovery um, near the end of the book. Um, and then, you know, because of the tooth that Will got from the demon, um, Magnus is able to summon the demon and ultimately we find out that Will's curse was completely fake and um, Will's sister's death comes down to her getting like spiked or something with like a stinger that from the demon and that's just what happened to kill her it was like an unfortunate coincidence the curse was completely fake um so Will kind of feels like weight's been lifted off his shoulders and he can be with Tessa so he's kind of over the moon with that um Henry and Charlotte we get a really nice scene with them where we kind of realise that they both were confused about why they got married. Um, they thought they weren't marrying out of love, even though they are both in love with each other, and we kind of get that really nice scene where they declare their love. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful moment. It's nice to um, have that focus and that love given to like an older couple or an adult couple. Because obviously, this is very much like young adult fiction, and I think Will and Tess and everything like 16 or something. Um, and they're very much like the central romances, but it is nice to have these romances between some older characters as well. Um, and then to try and kind of keep Tessa at the Institute, should Charlotte be kicked out, um, Jem proposes to her and kind of declares his love for her, and she accepts. And obviously we know everything with Will has just gone on, so we're like, oh my god, no, this is a hot mess. And my heart kind of really broke in advance for Will. Um... And then we kind of learn the truth about Benedict and how he has demon pox and everything, and that's why he was working with Mortmain, because he was kind of being given cures and treatment for it. Um, and Gabriel is still very much on Benedict's side for the most part, but Gideon chooses to stay at the Institute with everyone, which is a really kind of powerful moment. Um, and then Will declares his love for Tessa, but Tessa has revealed that she's engaged to Jem, and Will is absolutely devastated, but he accepts it because Tessa doesn't want to kind of hurt both of the guys. Um, so she tells Will that she doesn't love him and she loves Jem. So Will kind of has to accept that decision. And oh my god, the feels. Um, it's such a beautifully set up and realised plot line. I just love it so much. Um, and then Will and Jem kind of make up again in a really nice sequence. Then we get the ending with like the council meeting, um, where Charlotte's you know kind of commended for her actions, which is great. 
but then there's another attack by automatons um, and that's kind of a reminder that more main is very much still out there and you know things can only get worse and as Tessa and Jem's engagement is announced Charlotte announces she's pregnant with Emmy's child um, so again this is kind of racing the stakes um, for the third book because they're like so much is going right what you know what can possibly happen now and again it's the calm before the storm in a big way because it seems like this could be like a really happy ending but we all know that some characters are really not happy and um, you could be worried for their fate um, and then we get a really awesome ending where Cecily turns up at the Institute um, and says she wants to be a shadow hunter. She's run away from home, um, just like Will did. Um, and that's a really nice setup for the third and final book. Um, and I really liked that kind of plot point, how they revisited that scene from earlier on. Um, so yeah, that is Clockwork Prince. Um, again, a really, really great um, entry in the Infirmer Devices. Um, I really do love the Will, Tessa and Jem kind of love triangle and how that is managed and how Tessa's torn between the two guys. Um, Will is one of my favourite characters in all of Shadow Hunters anything um, and the torment he puts himself through is just so tragic um, but so beautiful at the same time. I think he's a superbly written character. I just love how complex he is um, and seeing him go through these highs and lows just in one book is just a very bittersweet thing because um, I was still very much rooting for him and Tessa at this point because um, I wasn't completely enamoured with um, Tessa and Jem until nearer the end of the third book really um, so yeah that was a really good kind of middle point in the story um, with some really great character moments really great, um, great plot twists, we got a few more answers particularly about what was going on with Will but we still weren't entirely sure about Tessa so we had some lingering um, questions for the third and final book which be this one, uh, Clockwork Princess uh, with Tessa on the front um, and with that we get what I feel is a very very satisfying conclusion to um, the story um, it did kind of help in terms of grand reveals with the whole gem becoming Brother Zachariah thing because I'd read the Mortal Instruments so I kind of knew where that was going um, and kind of putting two and two together about oh my god this is him yeah like, it took me ages to realise that Jem was that guy because I kind of skipped over the names a bit and I was like oh my god he's Brother Zachariah this is amazing I loved how that all connected because um, obviously they were, these were released kind of and Mortal Instruments would come out and then I think Inferno Devices would come out for like the last few books, I think that's how it worked. Um, so the story was told really, really well. I love that so, so much. Um, and obviously we saw Tessa at the end of Mortal Instruments as well, so we know these characters aren't just limited to the Inferno Devices because they do pop up in other mediums. You know, just like when I was talking about Tales from the Shadow Hunter Academy before, because we see all the characters from Inferno Devices in a couple of those stories as well. Um, but yeah, Clockwork Princess, starts off with a couple of flashbacks um, particularly one that I loved was the one with Will and Jem meeting for the first time which I really enjoyed and then we see the action have moved on about three months Will is still training Cecily even though he's not entirely happy that she's there um, then Gabriel kind of turns up to the Institute and reveals that um, Benedict has become a demon he's kind of turned like this giant worm so they have to go and kill it um, with Gabriel ultimately being the one to kill him. Um, then we get a bit more insight into Consul Wayland and he's a bit of a snake. Um, I really liked him as like a secondary antagonist for this book. Um, then we kind of realise that Mortmain has been buying up all the Infen so there's not much left for Jem to have. Um, which then kind of builds up to another attack by loads of automatons um, and Jem's very badly injured in that battle and obviously we know at this point there isn't much Yin Fen left so can he possibly survive this? Can he come back from this? Is this going to be where we lose him? Cause I, I've kind of been preparing myself to lose him because um, it's done clicked the whole Brother Zachariah thing at this point um, 
and I genuinely thought that's where they were going with it. Um, and then during that whole attack, you know, Jessamine's kind of been brought back to the Institute and she's killed in the battle. Um, and Tessa's kidnapped. Um, but Jessamine's kind of final words provide a clue that Cecily works out to where Mortmain is. Um, so Cecily works that out and I really liked the spotlight on her in this book. Um, because obviously we hadn't got much of her previously so she needed to be a big focus in this one and I think they did a really good job of just in this one book kind of really exploring her as a character, her relationship with Will and with Gabriel at the end. Um, so I really like her and Gabriel together. Um, and then we kind of learn a bit more about um, Aloysius and his granddaughter Adele and how they were kind of switched because his like blood granddaughter um, was actually raised by mundanes um, so in like this revenge attack like there had been like a baby swap um, and through that we learn that um, Aloysius' granddaughter his true one who was raised by mundanes had a child which was Tessa um, and that's kind of how she has these powers, which I thought was a really, really satisfying reveal. Because um, we had this like flashback at the start of the book, and like, where are they going with this? But it really pays off in like a major way later on, and I think that's just brilliant writing. Um, we also get a really nice sequence with Gabriel being comforted by Charlotte over him killing his father, and Gabriel kind of realises that he's wrong to follow Consul Wayland's orders to kind of report on Charlotte and kind of turn against her and he, um, he kind of realises that the console's completely wrong um, and there's like a redemption mark for him which I think is really powerful um, and Sophie and Gideon kind of declare their love for each other and get engaged which is awesome and we come to one of my favourite scenes in all the Shadowhunters um, where Jem and Will kind of say goodbye because Jem kind of orders Will to go and save Tessa even though he's dying and he's on his deathbed. Um, and they have like this final goodbye. Um, and Will's like, if there's a life after this one, let me meet you in it. And I'm like, what? That's the first time I, I think I may have ever cried at a book. I think. Definitely one of the first times that really got to me, that scene. I was like, I had to put it down and take like 10 minutes because, my God, so beautifully written. And we'd gotten to know these characters and their parabatai bond so, so well. Um, it was just heartbreaking to see them have this like final goodbye and see Jem find out that Will was in love with Tessa and everything. Um, and I love that it didn't kind of break them apart, both being in love with the same girl that brought them closer together with anything. Um, and then uh, Tessa, when she's been like kidnapped and in this like, mountain base, has contact with the angel Ithuriel, which is in her kind of pendant, her clockwork angel. Um, Will finds her, um, and they believe that Jem has died, um, because obviously Will felt the pain in his power of rune. Um, and they sleep together for the first time, kind of declare their feelings to each other. Um, and a really nice kind of thing is where we find out where the kind of white star birthmark for the Herondales came from, because um, Tessa's clockwork angel kind of fallen on Will's neck when they were sleeping, and that left that kind of mark, which I really, really liked how we got an origin for that. So we didn't really need it, but I loved it. Um, and then, you know, all these stories kind of come together at the mountain base. There's this huge battle sequence, and then it's revealed that Jem has actually become a silent brother, and he is brother Zachariah. Um, very emotional kind of plot twist. Completely caught me off guard. I loved it so, so much. Um, because Jem did kind of... He did... We did lose Jem because he's kind of becoming someone else now. Um, and then in one of my favourite kind of resolutions and deaths of a villain, um, which are another like genius kind of plot point, Tessa becomes the angel Ithuriel because she's had that contact with him, with her clockwork angel, and she becomes this angel and kills Mortmain, really great kind of thing that this entire series had been building towards. Um, I just loved how, you know, Tessa physically embodied an angel in that moment, and this amazing, like, grandiose sequence um, that had been building for, like, three books, 
Um, I loved it. Um, then Gabriel and Cecily kind of get together because um, they'd kind of been brief because of a romance with them throughout the whole of the third book and we see that come into fruition. Um, and I really like those two together. Um, and, you know, Tess is recovering and everything from all the events. And we get a goodbye sequence between Tessa and Jem. They call off their engagement because he's a silent brother now. And how, you know, they agree to meet every January at Blackfriars Bridge um, once a year for an hour. And um, they kind of make peace with what's going on. Um, it allows them both to kind of move on for each other and the whole situation. And it's a really beautiful goodbye. Um, even though we know it's not a forever goodbye. Um, and again, a really amazing scene with um, Jem saying goodbye to Will. And Will's like, I don't know how to be a shadow hunter without you. Um, and, you know, Jem's kind of very much giving them, um, giving Will his blessing to be with Tessa. Um, and, you know, he's okay with it. And the amount of love that is on show in these scenes with all these different goodbyes is just such a beautiful thing um so well built up and so well written and i i just i do not really understand how cassandra clare managed to pull this off so brilliantly because it, it just blows me away how well developed these three characters are together and separately um so we have those goodbyes and we kind of skip to like a christmas party um and i really like the idea that shannon has just throw a christmas party it just seems like such a mundane thing to do, so I really like that we got that. Um, and we see Jessamine's ghost appear to Will, telling him to kind of get his act together and propose to Tessa. Um, and that's, that's kind of a nice mini kind of redemp redemption for her as well. Um, really nice kind of sequence where her and Will have a really nice moment together, a really sweet moment, even though they didn't always see it eye to eye. Um, and Will proposes to Tessa, she says yes because they're in love, and those two along with Cecily and Gabriel kind of visit um, Will's parents and they have like this really emotional reunion with them um, and they even kind of make a joke where Will gets Gabriel's name wrong and it's just like a really happy upbeat ending then you turn the page and it says epilogue oh um, honestly one of the best endings to a book I think I've ever read um, an emotional gut punch, so bittersweet. Um, because we kind of find out Tess and Will have this really happy life together. They had children. He went on to have like, grandchildren and stuff. Um, and then Will dies of old age. I think he's like 78 years old or something. Um, and Tess is holding his hand when um, he's there. He's on his deathbed and everyone's there. I think Gideon had passed away. Um, but everyone else was kind of there for him in that moment. Um, obviously, I think Charlotte and Henry had died as well. But it's just such a sad scene because I love Will so much as a character. It really hurt me seeing him die, even though he got to live this happy life and he got to live the life he deserved after so much torment. Um, and then obviously Jem, or Brother Zachariah, is there um, and plays a violin for Will one last time. I'm getting really emotional just thinking about this scene. Um, and, you know, he's there with him and he's like, may you go in peace, brother, or something. And, only when the two people he loves the most are near to him does Will pass away with a smile on his face. Oh, it just gets me so emotional just thinking about it. Um, Will got kind of such a beautiful ending, and I love that so much. And I can't wait to see him again in, I think it's called the Last Hours Trilogy that will be coming out soon. Um, seeing a bit more of his life with Tessa, and oh god, just, oh, it's such a beautiful kind of relationship that they had. And, Tess is completely heartbroken by Will's death um, and she kind of realises that her children and grandchildren will go, grow old and die while she'll stay young so she can't really get close to them anymore so she kind of isolates herself from them goes travelling with Magnus because he knows what it's like to outlive loved ones um, that's kind of how those two characters probably bond um, and then we skip to 2008 which is just after the end of the Mortal Instruments and obviously at that point Brother Zachariah had been turned back into Jen so when they meet a Blackfriars bridge that year, Tessa sees Jem as Jem, um, and they kind of, you know, reunite and get back together. Um, which is a very bittersweet feeling, because you know Will will be happy for them, but at the same time Will's not there, and you wish Will was there for them. 
Um, but you know he'd be happy for them. Um, and you know Jem kind of waits so long, and Tessa had waited so long to be happy again. And I really like that they found that in each other, even though Tessa may have to go through the pain of losing Jem in the same way she lost Will, because I think Jem just ages normally now. Um, but it's nice because no matter who you kind of liked, be it Tessa and Will or Tessa and Jem, you got your happy ending because she had these happy endings with both of them, and I I just think that's such a beautiful way to end a love triangle. Um, because everyone is everyone got the ending they kind of earned and deserved, and I really love that. Um, and it kind of ends on almost a bleak note where Tessa kind of swears to herself she can't get close to any of her descendants because she doesn't want to cause any more pain and she doesn't want to have any more pain inflicted on her. Um, which is a very bittersweet kind of mindset to end the Infernal Devices on, um, but it just shows how much Will's death affected her. And, it's nice that through Jem, she still very much has a part of Will around to latch on to. Um, but in the same vein, you know, it's Jem and she loves Jem. Um, and I'm sure Will is watching over them very happily. Um, because they have so much love for each other, all three of them. It's just, oh. I mean, just if you haven't seen the video of me talking about why I love Tessa within Gem, just go and check it out, because even in that video I don't think I did justice to just how brilliantly written they are and what brilliant characters they are, but I think I got a lot of my thoughts across. Um, but yeah, Clockwork Princess, probably my favourite of the trilogy, just because of how emotional the ending is, and it's such a brilliant payoff to three books of setup and the way Mortman was defeated was brilliant and genius. The way the whole love triangle kind of ended happily for everyone was brilliant. Um, getting like these redemptions for Jessamine and Gabriel. Um, and Gabriel and Cecily getting together, Gideon and Sophie. Um, everyone got this like really happy ending. Um, and it all tied into the Mortal Instruments in such a brilliantly perfect way. Um, yeah, it's just... Infernal Devices is such a brilliant set of books and such... A brilliant story from start to finish. Incredibly written characters and these character arcs that just blew me away. Um, some of my favourite things I've ever read, some of my fondest memories are, you know, the feeling of, oh my god, this is the epilogue, this is the last time I'm ever going to read any new words in the Infernal Devices. And that goodbye with Gem and um, Will, the epilogue just, oh. It's a, such a bittersweet kind of story, but such a beautiful one. Um, and I just loved the setting of the whole thing. I loved all the characters. I loved the kind of steampunk theme running through it. Um, every single character had a beautiful arc, and I think that's such a rare thing. Um, but I truly do think the Infernal Devices is a work of art, and I just absolutely adore them. Um, I love the characters so much and I can't wait to see them all again, hopefully in the last hours. Um, it's just extraordinary what Cassandra Clare accomplished with these three books and um, I think about them a lot. I always go back to rereading them and I often find myself thinking about um, the good times where I was just sat in my bed in my first year of uni reading these books, completely falling in love and it's something I'll never forget and something I'll always love the Infernal Devices for. Um, yeah, I love this trilogy so, so much. Um, let me know what you think of them. Um, if you just think I'm mad for loving them as much as I do, hopefully not. Um, who your favourite characters are. Um, you know, what's, what your favourite book is, what your favourite moments are, stuff like that. Uh, let me know, and yeah, God knows how long this video is, I apologise. Congratulations if you made it this far, thank you for sitting through it all. Um, yeah, that's Infinite Devices. Just, for me, an absolute work of art. And until tomorrow, thanks for watching.